Chapter thirty seven of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. The Passing of the Sultans. This is my third visit to Constantinople during a momentous era in the great city's history. My first was in eighteen eighty nine when the notorious Sultan Abdul Hamid the Second was at the height of his power. He was ruling Turkey with an iron hand, giving secret orders for massacres and putting out of the way any of his subjects who opposed him. At the same time, he was in constant fear of assassination, and sat up night after night trembling with terror, until at length he was pushed off the throne by the young Turks in 1909. The movement that dethroned Abdul Hamid II may be said to have had its birth in the wild extravagances of his predecessor, Abdul Aziz, the father of the last of the sultans emerson says somewhere that a bad king is a blessing to a people if only he is bad enough to drive them to reforms abdul aziz was that bad he was one of the greatest spendthrifts that ever sat upon the turkish throne his reign was a long series of enormous expenditures of money borrowed from england and france he built palace after palace for it had been prophesied that he would live as long as he kept up his building he imported lions and tigers from africa filled his palaces with parrots and had pianos strapped on men's backs and played there he liked women so well that his harem is said to have had as many as that of king solomon who as i remember it had thirteen hundred wives and seven hundred concubines he fell in love with the empress eugenie among others and when she stopped a few days at constantinople on her way to the opening of the suez canal he put up a palace especially for her entertainment at one time, Abdul Aziz made a tour of the European countries and returned much impressed by the homeliness of the royal ladies he had seen. He declared that with the exception of Eugenie and Empress Elizabeth of Austria, all of them were hideous. A king's wife, he said, should be the most beautiful woman in his country, but the European monarchs appeared to have selected the plainest. He vowed he would try to find a woman as beautiful as Eugenie, and he thought he had done so when he took into his harem a circassian slave girl named miri who remained his favorite wife until the day of his death according to the old custom every sultan was given a beautiful slave girl at the close of ramadan or the mohammedan lent he received her on easter day or bairam the girl was selected by the valida sultana the mother of the sultan from a large number fifteen of whom were picked out and taken into the palace here they were fed groomed and put through their paces shortly before bairam the lucky girl was chosen and became the bride of the sultan for that year although he had a right to take also such other girls as struck his fancy he did not see his bairam bride until the night after the feast and then only when he had retired to rest if she happened to please him she was given separate apartments and her children were accorded royal rank on the other hand if the sultan did not like her she was put with the other slave girls and might never see him again during my first visit i got a peep at the jewels of the sultans which then of course stood in abdul hamid's name but to which abdul aziz had made many additions guarded by a squad of turkish soldiers and accompanied by officers whose swords clanked over the marble floors of the old seraglio i was permitted to feast my eyes on a collection of gems marvelous beyond all the dreams of aladdin i was astounded by the great collection of quilts embroidered in pearls take the largest bed quilt you have ever seen and cover it with embroidery of pearls of all sizes from the smallest seed pearl to some as big as a bird's egg imagine tens of thousands of these jewels put on in the most elaborate patterns so that only here and there you get a glimpse of the satin ground of the quilt and you have before your mind's eye one of the coverlets under which turkish royalty has rested in a case was a cradle encrusted with precious stones in which i doubt not a hundred or so of the children of the sultans had slept i counted a dozen or more gold hand mirrors set with diamonds emeralds and rubies that must have reflected the charms of many a harem beauty the most amazing features of the collection was a throne as big as your grandfather's armchair made of solid gold and studded with precious stones this chair of state was made for a shah of persia who was conquered by a turkish sultan of the sixteenth century 
it had a cushion of satin embroidered with pearls there was a magnificent toilet table with the top of lapis lazuli richly inlaid with gems and a mirror supported by small diamond encrusted pillars the claw feet appeared to be made entirely of diamonds emeralds rubies and carbuncles and about the edge of the table was a deep diamond fringe on one sword hilt i counted fifteen diamonds each as big as the end of a man's thumb and there were dozens of other swords decorated with jeweled hilts of solid silver the costumes on the waxen images of the various sultans of the past blazed with gems and a mannequin carved from a single pearl had an opal for a face and a ruby for a turban there were gold dishes and plates agate cups great pieces of coral and amber and big bowls of uncut stones at last i seemed to reach the saturation point and was unable to take in any more of the splendor spread out before my eyes yet while all these treasures were locked up in one of the royal palaces turkey had a foreign debt of more than one billion dollars and the country faced bankruptcy but to go back to the story of abdul aziz he spent so much money on his wives and palaces that finally the people dethroned him and confined him in the palace he had built for eugenie where he died five days later according to one story he committed suicide in a room adjoining the harem he had sent away his ladies asking miri for a hand glass and a pair of persian scissors so that he might trim his whiskers she brought them and he locked the door it was opened by ishmael bey who said that he found the sultan dying from wounds in the veins and arteries of his arms wrists and feet another story is that the sultan was assassinated by his political enemies murad v who succeeded to the sultanate became terrified and after three months went insane he was kept in seclusion until the day of his death and abdul hamid the second took his place abdul hamid came to the throne at twenty-four and ruled for thirty-five years his whole reign was full of conspiracy and treachery and frantic attempts to save his skin and his crown although he found the turkish empire bankrupt he added to its debt he promised to grant a constitution and then went back on his word during the latter part of his reign the sentiment against him grew stronger and stronger the young turks formed secret societies in all parts of the empire from their headquarters in paris they sent out propaganda smuggling into turkey tons of literature published in arabic finally they raised a revolutionary army to support their demand that abdul hamid give them a constitution at once the sultan was then ready to accede to their demands but before he could do so the young turks had marched upon constantinople and seized the city it was just at this time when abdul hamid was being torn from his throne that i made my second visit to turkey i saw the fighting watched the sultan taken from the palace and photographed the long procession of cabs hundreds in number which carried the ladies of his harem and their guard of eunuchs across constantinople on the afternoon before the revolution as i rode out to the sweet waters of europe i had noticed soldiers at all the crossroads and had been turned back when i tried to enter certain roads i heard afterwards that the young turks had about forty thousand troops with which they had surrounded constantinople they had bribed some of the common soldiers of the sultan's army many of whom had been conscripted from bulgaria to kill their officers three hundred of whom i was informed were murdered that night at the same time the revolutionists stationed their men in various parts of the city to keep order so that the whole thing was accomplished in the quietest possible manner the only shooting occurred in the early morning i was staying at the pira palace hotel and was awakened at about four o'clock by the sound of the rapid-fire guns popping away not half a mile distant one ball went through the transom above the front door of the hotel but no damage was done it was all over before the sun rose and when i went out on the streets this city of more than a million showed as little disorder as a new england village on sunday constantinople was under martial law but the soldiers were most polite and one could walk about without fear of being molested that afternoon i drove past the yildiz palace where the sultan was then imprisoned abdul hamid attributed the loss of his throne to the education that had been spread through turkey by the american schools in talking of this 
some time before his deposition he said it was robert college that lost me bulgaria and it will i believe eventually cost me my throne the young turks chose mohammed v to succeed abdul hamid they adopted some reforms though until the world war much the same conditions prevailed as before the revolution in nineteen eighteen a new sultan was chosen under the title of mohammed the sixth but on november first nineteen twenty two the grand national assembly of turkey voted to abolish his office and title and claimed for itself the supreme authority three days later the administration was taken over by the assembly and the constantinople cabinet of the sultan resigned mohammed the sixth fearing that his fate might be the same as that of abdul hamid took refuge on a british warship and left constantinople the assembly then elected as caliph or spiritual head of the moslem world abdul mejid the only cousin of mohammed the sixth and thirty-eighth in line of succession from Othman, who founded the turkish empire in twelve ninety nine he was a nephew of abdul hamid who in his insane fear of dethronement and assassination had kept him in a kind of gilded captivity for many years but even the spiritual leadership of his people and his titles of commander of the faithful vice-regent of the prophet shadow of god on earth was soon taken from poor abdul mejid in less than two years after his appointment he was notified in the palace of dolma bakshe that the national assembly of angora had abolished the caliphate and voted his immediate expulsion from turkey and so a broken old man he went with his family to paris to live a retired life devoted mostly to painting and music as president of the grand national assembly and commander-in-chief of the army marshal mustafa kemal pasha is the present ruler of turkey his government succeeded in getting the foreign troops out of constantinople and has made the turks masters in their own country it has imposed new taxes and makes the foreigners as well as the natives pay them it has negotiated with other nations and has got them to agree that in turkey foreigners shall be subject to the same laws as the turks and must be tried in the same courts this was not so in the past there used to be one law for the foreigner and another for the turk and the great powers dictated matters of foreign and domestic policy now the turkish government has taken upon itself the same rights and duties as those assumed by other governments of the world whether the people really are ready for all the great changes made or whether they will go back to former conditions remains to be seen end of chapter thirty seven end of the alps the danube and the near east by frank g carpenter